this session. This is now being recorded. Um, Christian uh, is known to most of us, I, I should think. Um, he, he's uh, a member of the committee of the Socialist History Society and his uh, book on uh, Louise Clips Molioch has actually been published as our latest occasional publication. Uh, Christian has already uh, put the link uh, to the publication in uh, the chat, um, but those of you who are members of the Socialist History Society, I think it's probably most of you, uh, should have got it already and had a chance to read it. Uh, Christian's well known, and many, well, his work on uh, C.L.R. James, but also he's co-edited a, a number of uh, related publications. And as I'm sure you know, having, those of you who've read the, uh, the book, uh, there is a relationship between his uh, current subject and uh, C.L.R. James. Um, so Christian's going to speak for about 20 minutes or so. He's got a few slides. Uh, and then um, Martin, uh, who is a descendant of the subject, um, will also speak and then we'll bring in others. Um, if we can, as usual, um, keep ourselves all on mute uh, while the speakers are talking, uh, and then there'll be lots of time for questions afterwards. And you can either put your questions in the chat or ideally uh, put the hands up uh, on the reactions uh, button on, on the screen. Uh, so uh, welcome to everybody and over to you, Christian. Thank you, Duncan. Thanks um, everyone for coming. Thanks to Socialist History Society for um, hosting this and a special thanks to, uh, yeah, some people like Martin. Um, uh, and I see other people here as well, um, David Lewis and, um, Jill Scott and stuff who, who, who helped uh, very much with 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 a sort of a publication um, as well this evening. Um, and yeah, uh, thanks to every yeah thanks to everyone uh, for joining and for those who who did help with the publication. I'll try and um, load up the, uh, a PowerPoint which is slightly um, temperamental. Hang on, um, but I'll, that, yeah, let's see. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, do 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 do. Uh, can people are people seeing something there? It's not come yeah, up yet. Some point. It's a bit okay. It, it tends to be at about a thirty second delay. So at some point, if if, if nothing comes up, let let us know. But uh, otherwise, um. So yeah, we're paying tribute anyway. Um, I, I'll, I'll start anyway. But without it, um, tonight, yeah, it's a remarkable uh socialist um. Louise uh, Cripp Samilov, um, and her life um, really was in sort of three parts in many ways. Her first uh, early part of her life in, in Britain, um, uh, she was born in 1904, um, and especially her work in the, in the Trotskyist movement um, in the 1930s. Uh, there's a photo, of, I don't know if people at the slideshow things come up yet at all? Any, yeah, um, it's just appeared. Yep, yeah. woo, amazing. What timing? So if you if you if you the first picture there is it's from the 1930s IL, ILP Independent Labour Party conference there, um, sitting next to the CLR James. That that was her time when she was most active as a socialist um, during during the 1930s. Um, I'll say more about that. Then there's a middle picture is, is relates to her the second part of her life, a time in, spent in America in the 1940s, 50s, and into the 60s. This is, I think. Uh, slightly crumpled um photo from uh when she got american citizenship i think in, in 1951 um so photograph in the middle there and then the final part of her life was spent in puerto rico from the late 60s um uh, until the end of her life uh, as a campaigner as a, a writer for um independence for puerto rico making the case there and particularly making the case for also as well for for socialism uh within that um and so this project, um, this book, little book really, came, came out in some ways of trying to um, build on her, her own 1997 memoir about her um, relationship and her, her thoughts on CLR James, memories and, and commentaries on, on CLR James um, in 1997, but trying to use that as a kind of basis to, to then explore the rest of her life. And again, thanks to so much to the family, her family, um for their help uh with this and and um which is really kind of critical really as well to making making this kind of thing possible um uh and 
So um, I'll briefly, yes, as I say, outline, I'll start with a sort of early part of her life. And so she was born in 1904 in England to a kind of middle class um, family. Um, she was an aspiring writer from a young age with a strong sense of injustice at the inequalities and um, injustice of Edwardian England all around her. Um, uh, uh, her father and, and brothers, some of her brothers, had quite a big family, went off to fight, fight in the First World War when she was growing up. Um, after the war, she, she studied journalism at what's yeah University College London, um, 1925 to 27. Um, and that kind of widened her horizons a bit. She was quite cosmopolitan as a student population at the time. But in general, she was still not really that um, political. Her friends around her, male friends, for example, um, did strike breaking during the general strike of 1926. And they didn't really think too much um, about, about this. Um, but she did manage to, yeah, have this quite successful conventional, I suppose, career. It's quite um, as a journalist. This is I don't know if the slides come up now. This is from Nursery World um, publication, which she was a journalist on and then the editor of it of in uh, the late 1920s and early 1930s. It was quite a sort of conservative, traditional publication when she started work on it. Um, but she kind of modernized it. Um, considerably, I think, as, as editor, professionalised it, changed the subtitle um, so that it was one about relating for mothers and nurses rather than kind of ideally aimed at kind of nannies of, of rich and powerful, um, if you like. So, so really, kind of, yeah, kind of modernised it. Carried articles, interestingly, on the on the Soviet Union, um, healthcare there at the time, um, and and the situation for kind of nurseries work, in working class areas in London. Um, and uh, and then she also, she, this time she was still primarily an aspiring writer as well, though. Um, she met people like Bertrand Russell and was quite influenced with his kind of, uh, the time, kind of modern ideas about, about marriage. She herself got married um, to uh, another journalist and another uh, aspiring writer, Bernard Glenser. Um, and she was working for London Vogue. She, after Nursery World, she worked for a period for London Vogue. Um, and there was this marriage bar in place, so uh, she had to keep her marriage um, to, to Bernard Glimpser kind of quiet so she could carry on working um, at, at London Vogue, where they kept trying to set her up with other eligible bachelors. Um, and she also, though, she was starting to get political as well. This is, you know, think about late 20s, early 30s, the Great Depression, uh, after Wall Street crash, mass unemployment rise of rise of fascism starting to be the rise of rise of fascism um and she formed this she helped with with bernard glimpser um uh, other people um a, a short-lived uh, journal uh she helped found this called 20th century and it was kind of trying to be a generational thing reflecting those that were born at the start um of the 20th century and uh, reflect their more kind of cooperative uh progressive views about the way forward kind of socialistic views uh, about the about the way forward um and then she, she she was steadily kind of moved got more and more political because you know circles she was moving in literary circles at the time politics was the key thing she herself went with with bernard glemser to uh, germany and austria on holiday in 1932 um she saw kind of nazis on the march on the streets and and, and growing support for fascism bernard glemser himself was jewish so this was uh yeah, uh, extra concerning um, for them at the time. And she also, thanks to, um, she, in her circles, was a early pioneering British Trotskyist. He was still a member of the Communist Party uh, when, she, when, she, when she first met him, called Jerry Bradley. Um, it was an interesting um, figure. He fought in the First World War, um, and then he became political, joining the Communist Party early on, becoming also involved in the Irish Republican movement at the time of the kind of uh, Irish War for Independence, and an early full-time organiser of the National Unemployed Workers movement. But, uh, but Bradley had become more critical of the Communist Party of Great Britain's role during the, role during the general strike, um, and so began to identify more with Trotsky's kind of critique, and he became a kind of important early figure in British Trotskyism, famous famed for its kind of oratory and his audacity. And there's a this amazing story, um, which is Graham Stevenson had on his website about Jerry Bradley, but I'll just read to you because it is 
is it's quite yeah it's quite quite cool um i'll quote in may 1933 um jerry bradley described as a writer uh, living at jubilee place kings road chelsea and two other men were charged with pouring red paint over the head and shoulders of a wax statue of adolf hitler displayed in the rooms of madame tussauds after which they also hung a placard saying hitler the mass murderer on a cord dangling from his neck um, which is quite, yeah, it's quite good to go into Madame Two Swords and muck up the uh, Hitler uh, effigy. Um, they got fined for that, but um, it gives a sense of the, uh, yeah, kind of audacity of, of, of Bradley. Um, and she and Bradley put her on to reading um, Trotsky's History of the Russian Revolution, which came out in 1930 and won a lot of people over to kind of Trotskyism. And I don't think the next slide has come up, but this is this is the um, a fuller picture of the uh, Independent Labour Party um a conference in 1936 the group she joined the british trotskyist um a uh, particular little splinter of group that she joined was was became the marxist group inside uh interest organization inside the independent labor party here and she says you know we were all young and idealistic she's talking about little marxist group uh, around people like clr james she says we're all young and idealistic we felt our work could contribute to a time when we would see socialism spreading when the poor would not be starving, when the homeless were given shelter, when the unemployed would be guaranteed jobs. Most of all, we believed we would help working people of all nations realize they had no interest in fighting in imperialist wars. Um, and in her in her memoir, she this really amazing passages, which are almost very dramatic, uh, describing her times, particularly um, visiting Paris uh, with C.L.R. James and with a, with a friend of hers in the Trotskyist movement, Esther Heiger, in, in the spring of 1935. Um, and Trotsky himself had, was ex exiled. He was actually in Paris at the time. So there were a lot of, it was a big centre of sort of international Trotskyism in Paris and France at the time. And um, yeah, she she describes obviously going and seeing like sightseeing around the place with C.L.R. James. It was obviously fascinating because he was working and yeah, you know, C.L.R. James was working on his history of the Haitian Revolution uh, by that point. So he was he was going to Paris frequently and trying to do research and things like that. But going around some of the big sites, but also these kind of clandestine meetings uh, with with Trotskyists. And um, she was invited to be actually um, Trotsky's secretary at one point. He, 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 he thought that she'd be ideal because she, her journalistic experience um, as a writer. Um, but she was married at the time and didn't feel that um she could, could make that kind of commitment um at that time because because of her because of her marriage um uh she did however have yes yeah, as, as alluded to um she had she did embark there however on a, on a relationship with clr james um from 1935 to 37 uh, approximately and this is a pit this is sort of a how perhaps she's best known on one level to a wider audience, really. It's through her relationship with with, with, with CLR James uh, in this critical, tumultuous time of, of the 1930s. Um, both, it was a difficult relationship. Both, both were married to other people at the time. Um, she had to, it was traumatic as well. She had to have two um, backstreet abortions, which were, you know, highly deadly, dangerous, dangerous procedures in this period. Um, and she and she later turned her experiences, her um, sort of fictionalized her relationship with C.L.R. James into a novel, um, which she was start which she'd been working on in later later life and was finally published in 1997, um, uh, Lirazel. Um And uh, yeah, she um, uh, yeah, she but she she was key figure really in many ways in in sort of um as within the tiny trotskyist movement she you know the fact she was a journalist had this experience meant she was very useful for the trotskyists in terms of um the little group in terms of putting out uh their publications so she played an important role supporting that she would often she would often you know go around around and, and and sometimes speak and stuff at meetings um and in general by supporting sort of someone like clr james in this period she, she's one of these kind of one of many kind of neglected sort of women around the who, who did tend to support the kind of pan-africanist movement um you think of people like dorothy Pizer, who was partner of um george padmore another trinidadian leading pan-africanist activist in the, in the 30s 40s and 50s in, in britain um there's other people like dinah stock who um 
uh, helped support Yomo Kenyatta, a Kenyan nationalist. Um, other figures more broadly, you might think of people like Ethel Mann and Nancy Cunard, who are also around these kind of circles. Um, and uh and and help support so these kind of often people like louise cripps dorothy pizer Dinah stock are really quite neglected figures and so i felt that since obviously my work had mainly been on clr james i should try and really owe it to, to try and try and uh but yeah try and give louise cripps more of a kind of respect she's she's due here in in terms of her work around sort of not just anti-capitalism but also sort of anti-imperialism as well um um but next yeah she this is an example I don't know how long it'll take for a PowerPoint slide to move around, but um, there's also, I've got a PowerPoint here, which shows um, her, uh, in fact, she wrote, wrote for um, Controversy, which is the Independent Labour Party discussion journal, sort of an internal bulletin at the time. It later became a broader, more open um, public kind of left-wing journal of, of debate and controversy. That was, the, that was the title. And here's not, you can see a reference here to an article she wrote on terrorism in the Soviet Union. Um, this is, uh, I think from uh, relating to the um, Kirov uh, assassination and the, the right start of uh, kind of Moscow, Moscow trials just about to start. Um, uh, or actually, yeah, just about to start. Um, uh, alongside, yeah, Keith, it's, it's a shame. I mean, the ILP in this period, I mean, their offices got bombed during the Second World War. So I think there's unfortunately trace of that actual journal issuer is 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 missing that that's impossible to to find and i think that's probably true of some of our other writing as well in this period which is a shame we don't actually have sort of more examples of of actual political writing from this period um she did write book reviews earlier on for the listener which um which uh Bernard Glimpse have worked on and that's quite interesting because someone after I, after this thing got published someone contacted me um to say that it's now possible for the listener archive to actually um uh, kind of find of some because they were anonymous book reviews, but they have actually got names to them in the listener archives, and that actually could shed more. Uh, might be able to actually more some of her writing might come to light still there. Um, okay, um, her relationship with T.L.R. James ended in in nineteen thirty eight. Um, it's interesting. I should say on this um, shows that she wrote under her name Lillian Cripps rather than um, Louise. Glimpser, which would which would be her kind of married name. It's interesting she used this other name for her writing in terms of politics at this time. Um, her relationship with James ended in 1938. She returned, um, yeah, much more to Bernard Glimpser. They had a son, um, Martin, who's Martin Samlov's father. <laughs> yeah, um, and then with the uh, uh, outbreak of the Second World War, she and her son um, uh, went to New York in in June 1940, and this this is marks the second part of her life. Bernard Glimpse has stayed in in he couldn't um, go with her. He stayed and worked as an intelligence officer with the RAF uh, during this during the Second World War. Um, so the second part of her life in America, I mean, she was there then as a kind of single mother, really. Um, so kind of a lonely life on one level, but she did soon start kind of you know making networks and new networks and things like this, and she published her. Uh, first book called Your First Baby, which is here. Um, kind of bait, yeah, guide. It sort of does what it says on, on, on the cover, really. Um, guide to bring up uh, her experience of looking after a baby. Um, and then she, if I move along, she then, um, she also then edited um, uh, uh, quite a successful magazine called Baby Post. As well, this is a, this, this PowerPoint slide when it lines up shows this is 1955 edition um, here, which I found online. And and by then she'd married, um, yeah, her relationship with Bernard Glimpse had, had broken down. She she then married um, Lev Samilov, uh, Russian uh, uh, born um, uh, uh, engineer, and he was he was the son of a brilliant sci uh, scientist. Um, uh, who'd won the, he was a physiologist, uh, uh, um, Lev Samlov's father, Alexander, had, had been a physiologist, electric uh, cardiologist, who'd won the Lenin Prize in 1930. But it's interesting on this house on slide, in very small print, you can see that Lev Samlov is the uh, secretary and treasurer of Baby Post. So she's the editor um, here. And this led to a work on being on, on television for Louise Cripps. She, she um, was a presenter. Um, as well and she brought on she had kind of guests such as um uh the head of the planned parenthood 
um, which is a pioneering organization in America in the fight for reproductive health access um, and rights. But he was um, the head, the head she wanted to speak was was not able to talk about birth control there directly. It's it's testament to the sort of social conservatism of post-war America. Um, there, but she's obviously trying to be progressive in 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 her different ways here. I think as well, and trying to bring kind of more modern kind of ideas about about parenthood uh, into into America. Here, she also campaigned more in her way. She was kind of unable to really be an act be an activist as such in this, this way. But she did um, make a stand against McCarthyism. Um, she in a way she she worked to try and get um Adelaide Stevenson elected for the Democrat Party um and she did hold these meet, meetings around the Dem for Democrats around or we Adelaide Stevenson clubs I think they were called with socialists such as Norman Thomas who she knew veteran American socialist and also activists from the NAACP civil rights organizations um so America though she's mainly working on this um being busy and bringing up yeah bringing up uh, her son um she also suffered in sort of angina so increasing illness as well which also um meant, meant activism was kind of difficult um and then finally the third period of her life um uh from sort of late 60s early 70s she'd moved to puerto rico and although you're having a kind of privileged sense there in um puerto rico being a kind of american sort of citizen and so on like this she used her position to um make advocate you know the, the case for independence and also use the time she had because she retired now to actually do some of the writing she'd always really wanted to do more more of her own writing her own work um and she had an important um uh, friendship with um gordon k lewis so see david lewis is here on the call which is um great uh yeah um gordon k lewis and um partner Sybil, who was Trinidadian. Now, Gordon K. Lewis was a Welsh-born historian of the Caribbean um, and, uh, yeah, uh, an important, really leading figure in terms of Caribbean studies more generally. He'd been, he was based at the University of Puerto Rico um, by this period. And as Gordon K. Lewis, who wrote, wrote lots about Puerto Rico as well, um, put it, he said, um, uh, you know, there, there's much about Puerto Rico that was obviously different from both from Britain and and the US. But there, his Gordon Lewis described how his experience in the socialist movement. He'd also been active in the 1930s, a bit around the Communist Party, gave him advantages when understanding uh, Puerto Rico itself, his Caribbean island, become his new home. And I'll just quote what Gordon K. Lewis wrote about this. He said uh, he reflected on this in 1983. He said the British socialist tradition, out of which I grew, had always taken an active interest in the colonial problem. A whole school of English progressive opinion, influenced as much by Burke as by Marx, Hobhouse, Cole, Lasky, Tawney, had argued the incompatibility of democracy with empire. It was thus easy for me to identify immediately with the struggle of colonial nationalism that engulfed the Caribbean after 1945. That tradition has not existed in the United States, which is why so many of my American liberal friends in Caribbean studies have never really understood, for example, the Puerto Rican struggle for national independence. Even today, they argue for the liberal alternatives, autonomy, limited transfer of powers, a sense of imperial responsibility, economic aid to the colony, all of which ignores the fundamental issue. But as Burke put it magisterially, this servitude, which makes men subject to a state without being citizens, may be more or less tolerable for many circumstances. But these circumstances, more or less favourable, do not alter the nature of the thing. The mildness by which absolute masters exercise their dominion leaves of masters still so essentially you have to have you need to try and break from colonial uh, oppression colonial domination and i think this obviously applies an important sense to louise's own work and solidarity with puerto rican struggle for independence uh, from american domination in fact she worked so closely you know with clr james understood that wider uh, struggle for for self government self determination in terms of the anglophone caribbean um she also wrote about the um, later years wrote about the spanish caribbean more broadly um, she wrote, she wrote a, um, a history of a history of the Spanish Caribbean as well in, in later years. What she argued about Puerto Rico was this need for both independence and socialism, what she called a change from the roots up, a complete social planning, not in regard for what is good for American corporations or for business, solely in the interest of what is best for all the people of Puerto Rico. And she says, idealistic, certainly. Socialism is an idealistic concept. Man does not live by bread alone. Romantic, yes. 
but Puerto Ricans are a romantic people and the call for independence for a recreation of the island in its earlier image of a paradise will not go unheeded. Feasible economically? Certainly, hard realistic figures show that for a poor majority, socialism is the only way out of their centuries old dilemma. And independence is the necessary provision for putting a socialist system into practice. It's the achievement of these two goals which will one day return this lush island in the Caribbean back to its truly paradisical nature. Now, obviously, Puerto Rico today is very far from that. I mean, uh, any kind of paradise that's been hit by, you know, hurricanes, uh, devastating kind of so-called nat natural disasters. Um, and in response, there's been a kind of what Naomi Klein has called a kind of disaster capitalism. Um, and there's, so there's a kind of growth in, in, I think, in Puerto Rico, again, in kind of thinking again about these questions about self-determination, socialism, independence again now, especially in, in sort of recent years. Um, she, she also published in 1987 another ambitious book uh, about Russian imperialism, Russian empire, called The Russian Eagle. Um, this obviously relates to her interest in the Soviet Union log standing in a sense ever since reading Trotsky's history of Russian Revolution back in the 30s, but also her relationship with um, Lev Samolov and the whole fact she used to go and visit the Soviet Union regularly um, with him and see the, sort of the architecture and, and, and so on as a, as a tourist. And this book, um, yeah, it's really, it's very, very neglected, hard to get hold of. In fact, there's only one, there's probably only one or two copies in existence, unfortunately. It, it wasn't a, it wasn't a commercial success, but it's, um, it, unfortunately, but it, um, it's, it's, it's fascinating the way it challenges some of the preconceptions in the West we have about Russia. And it has us have a kind of class analysis running throughout it. It discusses literature and art. In the little book, um, we reproduce as appendix, um, the, the chapter on the great Russian artists there. And she made kind of, you know, telling parallels with kind of Western European royal families, um, for example, uh, and the czars uh, throughout. So I'll just quote this little bit because it's quite amusing given the royals are often in the news in Britain at the moment, unfortunately. But she says, Ivan the Terrible, so she says, Ivan the Terrible's cruelties and barbarism exceeded those of his contemporaries, though their hands were scarcely clean of blood. In England, there was Richard III, who had his two nephews smothered in the Tower of London to obtain the throne, and Henry VIII, who got rid of some of his six wives by having their pretty necks chopped off, took over the monasteries and their money, and created a time of terror against Catholics and any nobles he considered troublesome. There was also Philip II of Spain, whose armies marched all over Europe, including Holland and Italy, and whose Spanish Inquisition has held a place in history for its torturous burning at the stake and other forms of human atrocities. The Borgia, too, have a dark stain against their name in history. It was scarcely a time of gentle and civilised monarchies. Um, and so that was one of our sort of final books. Um, and um, shortly afterwards, unfortunately, Lev Samolov died. She she was then in the 90s, uh, 1990s, she was kind of then there. And she and was still remarkably managed to managed to publish her the memoir of C.L.R. James in 1997 and her and her um, uh, a novel. Uh, Lirazel as well shortly before her death um, in 2001. Um, so I think just sum up really, I think, you know, Louise Samolov is a very neglected figure, but was this kind of impressive citizen of the world who never stopped seeking justice in all its colours, uh, to quote a Puerto Rican writer uh, describing her. Um, and from her early consciousness of injustices around her while growing up, through her active opposition to racism, fascism and imperialism during the 1930s, and her attempt to counter McCarthyism in the 1950s, um, onto the many works she penned in her later years to advance arguments for self-determination in Puerto Rico, she kept uh, to her kind of internationalist and socialist principles while manifesting great courage, openness and a sense of adventure. Um, hers is a remarkable legacy and one that offers encouragement and inspiration for us all. Um, so I'll stop uh, sharing uh, and pass over for a little bit to Martin, who um, grands, her grandson, who's amazing. Oh, Duncan, you're muted, maybe. Yeah, Duncan, muted. Uh, you're, you're, you're OK now. No, you're muted. Again. Maybe Martin, Martin, come in, yeah. Sorry, I realised I was still <laughs> muted. Thanks very much, Christian. Um, over to you, Thank Martin. You. Okay. Thanks, Duncan. Christian, I'd like to first of all congratulate you on the uh, publication of this book. It's been an honour to uh, collaborate with you. 
And uh, I found this uh, a very rewarding experience. Uh, and I've learned an awful lot about my grandmother, who was somebody I thought I knew pretty well. Uh, I have to say uh, a lot of the memories that have come back from uh, just thinking about the various times in my life where my grandmother was involved. Uh, so, some of the memories that, that, that come back, I th think I should start at the end. The last time that I saw my grandmother, Louise, was uh, in 2000, in April. This is uh, just uh, <clears throat> over a year before she passed away. Louise had actually fallen in her home in Dorado, Puerto Rico. And uh, she broke her back. So it was probably about a year later when I visited her in Puerto Rico and saw her for the last time. She was in personal care. She weighed about 75 pounds, was immobilized, bedridden essentially, but as sharp as I, I ever knew her. Uh, she read the paper every day. When I was visiting, I'd bring her flowers. We were actually drinking rum and Pepsis, uh, which was kind of a favorite pastime. So really, in a lot of ways, nothing in my relationship with Louise had changed, despite the fact that she was no longer mobile. Uh, she was very sharp. She still read a lot of books. And uh, we had some really great re reminiscences. So I was glad that I was able to share that time at the end of her life. And even after her passing, there are so many things that I have come to learn as a result of your research. Uh, Louisa's memoir on CLR James is something I wasn't even aware of until I saw your references to it in writing. And I actually obtained a copy online from one of Bernard Glemser's stepdaughters who uh, uh, actually contacted me online around the same time that I had established a relationship with uh, uh, my cousin Rosie Fisher who was Bernard Glemser's granddaughter. So we share the same grandfather, essentially. Um, <clears throat> uh, I found Louise's writing on CLR James uh, and the parallels that, that you were able to uh, use in this book, uh, very informative. And Louise's insights as far as her relationship to CLR James that you also highlight in your book are basically news to me. I mean, there's so much about her that I didn't know. In a sense, I would consider her to be the ultimate subversive. It's hard for me to reconcile that a person of her particular Marxist ideology could also be an editor of uh, children's books or uh, publications uh, about raising families. And uh, another thing that I noticed in Louise's writing, especially at the end of her life, is that she kind of independently saw the same parallels in terms of what's going on in the world. And it's it's easy to say history repeats itself. And in a way, I think we're seeing history repeating itself a century later. And we're seeing the echoes of history as well in our current time in terms of the rise of autocracy. Um, so many things are going on right now in the world. Israel comes to mind the idea of judicial reform kind of as a disguise for a new form of autocracy as one example. But again, other reverberations of that same kind of a history seem to be going on in the world. So when I think about Louise's writing, she's really writing about the 20th century. I mean, her life spanned that entire century from start to finish. And all of the things that were going on in the world at that time when she was an aspiring journalist the parallels are stark, to say the least, that we have a world that's essentially uh, facing increasing international conflict uh, in, in a time of economic turmoil and a time where people are yearning for change, for political reform, for uh, a better way of life. The struggles of humanity are more or less unchanged, which I find very interesting that with all of the time that we've had to bring about change, there's kind of a two steps forward, one step back uh, appearance in, in how the world has been conducting itself. When I think about the very first time that I remember 
my grandmother, uh, she certainly was a dramatic person. And I was actually born in the United States. So the first memories of my grandmother are in the house where Lev and Louise lived in Huntington, Long Island. I was about five years old and my grandmother sat me down and I'm not sure what the point of the conversation was, but the first thing she said to me was, you know, one day your grandmother's going to die. Now I was only five years old, so my grandmother's gonna die. I mean, that's all I can remember about the conversation. I think she was trying to impress on me that life is short, we have to make the most of it. But uh, that was kind of a dramatic introduction to the meaning of life for me anyway, almost traumatic, I'd say. Um, there, there are certain aspects about Louise, uh, certainly a, a dramatic person, and some some of the uh, some of the uh, uh, images of Louise's life that you that you bring up in your in your book, Christian. Um, when Louise was in school, and the headmistress had actually caused enough turmoil in, in one of uh, Louise's uh, uh, classmates that the poor young woman was so distraught without thinking she was accidentally run over. And to me, that is something that, it sounds like something that should be in a movie. And there are other <clears throat> scenes that, that to me are like a screenplay in a movie. So that was an example. Uh, uh, another example is just the thought of her having to make her way from England to the United States. That period of turmoil when it looked like Germany was about to invade and the, the expansion of, of Germany across Europe certainly prompted a lot of people to change their plans and, and move further away. Again, we see that same kind of stark parallel in what's going on in the current conflict with Russia and Ukraine, uh, a whole new refugee crisis that's, that's now uh, on us. Um, another example of something that I think would be a scene in a movie is imagining when uh, Bernard Glemser has decided uh, that the au pair girl should uh, maybe also be someone that he can sleep with, that seems sort of an unusual uh, and and certainly uh, not appropriate uh, relationship to foster with with the help. And then to have the same individual uh, sent away only to come back as a Hitler youth, <laughs> complete in uniform. To me, that's just something that seems like it, it should be a scene in a movie. When uh, I think of those times in Long Island, that that house in, in Huntington, it was such a beautiful place for, for my childhood. And uh, I have such great memories of looking out over uh, Long Island Sound. Uh, we were certainly a family of swimmers. Louise was, was a great swimmer. She loved to uh, spend time outdoors. She loved painting. Um, her appreciation of, of art and literature, I think, certainly made an impression on me. And some of my earliest memories uh, of being in Long Island are the beautiful uh, nights where you could see stars. It was such a beautiful place at night, uh, very calm, very clear skies. And it certainly fostered my interest in, in astronomy, which I, actually ever since childhood has been uh, something dear to me. Uh, the first time that our family visited my grandparents in Puerto Rico, they actually lived in a place called El Palmar, which was east of San Juan, the capital of Puerto Rico, and very close to uh, the uh, Isla Verde beach. I'm not sure how many years they lived there, but when we visited my grandparents, it was my eighth birthday, that would have been in 1967, I actually got my first telescope. And... Uh, of course, I was very excited to use it. In fact, the night that I that I got the telescope, uh, there was quite the uh, uh, spectacular stellar event. I guess at that time, there was some type of testing going on where uh, rockets were being launched from the US Virgin Islands, just east of Puerto Rico, and doing atmospheric testing. So I actually saw what looked like an explosion in the sky, which was in fact some type of uh, experiment that was going on at the time. I believe uh, top secret, in fact. So uh, that, that certainly was the beginning of uh, my interest in uh, astronomy and uh, a lot of those uh, memories, I think also I attribute to the person who I thought of as my grandfather, Lev Samoylov. Now, Lev Samoylov for my father was really 
the father figure, and I think we we both benefited from Lev's uh, analytical mind. He was an engineer by profession, uh, was always curious about how things worked, and uh, certainly an influence on on my dad, who went on to become a geneticist and taught biochemistry, a lot of the pre-medical sciences. Uh, my dad was a true academic. He did research. Uh, we had the opportunity actually to live in Puerto Rico once my dad received tenure at the University of Manitoba. And I ended up graduating from high school in Puerto Rico. So my, my dad, I guess being uh, in the family tradition, a person who rebelled against his own family, joined the US Army. And in so doing sparked his interest in, in sciences where he uh, actually was a, a weather a meteorologist who surveyed areas where I guess military testing was trying to use uh, different types of uh, weaponry and to look at the results of the effects in the atmosphere in the air. Uh, a lot of that would be, I guess, uh, <clears throat> no longer con considered any form of uh, legal warfare, but uh, it prompted my dad's interest in wanting to learn more and, and certainly uh, led to his interest in biochemistry. Um, as, as an American, I think moving to Canada was uh, uh, an, an excellent move as far as uh, the future that my father saw for, for his family. And I'm certainly glad that, that we live in Canada now. I mean, let's talk about a whole new era of McCarthyism literally going on. Uh, again, it sort of seems like the parallels that even Louise describes are uh, quite striking when you look at what's going on currently. I think in some ways she was uh, prescient in seeing what type of a, a world we were we were moving toward. In fact, I have a quote from she had an article from uh, her her book Puerto Rico: The Case for Independence. And let's see, it's on. Page 75, this is from an article from the New York Times. Now, this was published about 50 years ago. Uh, the blacker arts of espionage and sabotage are now being employed to confuse the people and harass and vilify the opposition. The new thing now is that it's being organized and mechanized by men in the service of the President of the United States and turned to a form of political and psychological warfare. It sort of seems like that would be ripped from today's headlines. If I uh, can just also mention that my family name, Samoylov, is derived from my dad's stepfather, Lev Samoylov, my grandmother's second husband. So in all of my lifetime, I thought of Lev Samoylov as my grandfather in the same way that my own dad, Marty, would have thought of Lev as his father. Uh, sadly, uh, it would be fair to say that Bernard Glemser, my dad's real father and my real grandfather, was absent from our lives. And uh, I've only learned again recently from uh, reading uh, your publication as well as Louise's memoirs that CLR James had offered himself as my dad's godfather so essentially my dad had two fathers in absentia but the real person that we saw uh, as as that father that patriarch was Lev Samoylov and he was quite, quite the old world gentleman I like to think of him he he really was uh, uh, a brilliant uh, speaker he was multilingual uh, he was a very patient man. I remember as a teenager, he was doing a fence repair with a hammer and hammering a nail, he accidentally hit his thumb. And if it had been me, I probably would have been screaming and cursing. And all that my grandfather did, he looked at his thumb, maybe he counted, I don't know, five seconds. And then he just went back to hammering. Uh, that really was the kind of person he was. He, he, he was very patient, very kind. Uh, he was a great person to have discussions with, uh, and I can see that, in, in a way, Lev and Louise were perfect for each other, that they could have discussions, they could argue, they were respectful, I mean, things could get heated, but there was always 
kind of a, a, a reconciliation that that showed that they were really caring individuals. And again, I, I would say for Louise, as as my grandmother, she was really a very generous, kind person, probably one of the most outgoing people I've ever known, in that she was able to uh, really put herself in any type of social situation and come out with new friends and new contacts. Uh, all throughout my life, uh, the, the people that I met through Louise were very, very admiring of her and very respectful of, of her ideas. And I never found at any point in my life that she really imposed any type of ideology that would be in conflict with anyone else. She, she, she could talk to conservatives, liberals. It really didn't matter. She, she could hold her own in any type of a situation, which I will always respect. Um, thank you. Thank you, Martin. Is that it? Thank you very much for your memories. Right. Thank if, you. I can, if I can bring in others now, uh, questions or comments. Um, best if you put your uh, hands up on reactions there for I can see who you are. Otherwise, wave at me. Somebody must have some. Right. Uh, John Walker first. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe I missed it, but I, how did you get um, involved in the Puerto Rican um, uh, independence question? Um, but the other thing that that um, I uh, uh, the, the the or the gap that I or the question that arose, um, uh, Christian said that uh, Luis. Um, uh, sort of dropped out of political activity when raising children, um, which happens to so many people, I think, but I mean, not just women, not, more women than men, perhaps, but I think both. Um, but the, uh, but then um, she was living in the States uh, at the time of the Vietnam War. I just wondered if, 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 if she was at all involved in the anti-war movement there. Christian, do you want to respond? Yeah, well, Martin as well might have some thoughts yeah. as well. I mean, in terms of, I think in terms of getting involved with Puerto Rico and thing, I think, you know, I think she visited there like for a holiday originally, but then obviously found that it was nice and then they decided um, to move to to make the move there, um, and I think once she was there, she would have obviously been interested in what was going on. And the fact that Puerto Rico stood out as a place that had chosen a route not to go independent. Everywhere else was, you know, decolonizing, you know, and you know, becoming yeah post-colonial new independent societies. And Puerto Rico had chosen a different path of trying to work with the U.S. on one level um, rather than push for independence for the key. Puerto Rican uh, figures and and so I think she that would have interested her about that and then steadily I think just you know her early some of you wrote early books aimed at like um, visitors and stuff tourists and stuff about Puerto Rico but then steadily I think the injustices of a kind of you know a society that's essentially colonial society set up and given our whole background she would have seen enough injustices there to want to respond and write to her. I think so I think that's how she would have got there and I think also that explains a bit the fact she was primarily in Puerto Rico I think by the late 60s means that's why Vietnam in a sense wasn't there um but, you know uh, was such, such a thing although it was obviously a, a key backdrop and she was aware of all the wider you know she would have been aware of all the wider movements uh around that time yeah I don't know Martin if you wanted to respond Martin to that. do you want to add well, certainly, I think um, Levin Louise enjoyed uh, traveling, and and during that time in the fifties and sixties, their travels took them to a lot of different places in the Caribbean. I think from Panama, Jamaica, quite a few of the destinations as uh, tourists. Puerto Rico, I think, stood out in a lot of ways when I look back and think about her relationship with CLR James. I think there was a very strong Caribbean connection that also influenced Louise's finally settling on Puerto Rico. But Louise had a very special love for the people of Puerto Rico. And, and I think that is her, her real attraction to living in the island. And for me growing up and 
having the chance to visit my my family in Puerto Rico, it really was almost like a dream. It, it just seemed like paradise in a lot of ways. And I guess in a way I was naive. In, in reality, uh, Puerto Rico uh, over the years uh, became a, a place that progressed, I guess, progressed in terms of embracing uh, all of the trimmings of American society. And when I had the opportunity to go to high school in Puerto Rico, I was actually at a U.S. Air Force base, high school. My dad had served in the U.S. Army, which gave me the opportunity to enroll. And of course, the antithesis of pretty much of my grandmother's relationship to Puerto Ricans by being at, at a U.S. Air Force base uh, created kind of a uh, an interesting uh, uh, tension. But uh, her her love of Puerto Rico was was really inspired by meeting people there. And there was a particular incident that happened in 1978. It's called the Cerro Maravilla incident, where U.S. agents had actually entrapped two young Puerto Rican men into committing uh, a bombing of a, a radio installation in the mountains in Puerto Rico. Uh, these two individuals, uh, I think, ended up actually murdered as a result of this uh, particular incident. And it sparked outrage, not only in Puerto Rico, but uh, uh, elsewhere. And it was from that point on uh, that Louise's writing actually, I think, took uh, a much more uh, strong stance in terms of Puerto Rican independence. Thanks. Um, right, there's uh, two questions come through in the chat from Kasoa John. Um, the first one is, I wonder if you could describe her as a feminist. And the second question, can you say much about her relationship with other women, particularly black women? Um, Kristen, do you want to go first? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there's other people that Jill Scott who are here on the call who we just get, yeah, who read, who read, kind of read and gave some comments on the on the on the booklet um and and i remember because it's interesting with louise good sample of it she she um possibly yeah she doesn't seem to have been a more um a kind of a, I, I don't know what whether she would have called herself a, f a feminist except in perhaps in the sense about rebecca west saying you know when i object to being downtrodden i uh, described as a feminist um I, I think you know it's an interesting question she was born at a time you know, she got active at a time just after the sort of first wave of, of uh, in terms of feminism around the suffragette movement had been had sort of won some victory. She actually got to vote um, in the 1929 um, election for the first time. But those kind of I suppose on one level, those kind of battles, early battles that when you had a, a, a woman's movement as such had, had, had passed by the time she became political on one level. Um, and then. In the US, I think she did push against, obviously, as I said, the social conservatism she found in the US and 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 um, in Britain. So in that sense, I think she would have, um, yeah, perhaps perhaps in that sense, you know, there's, a, there's definitely a feminist angle going on there. Um, but again, it's not something, yeah, in her, yeah, but in her novel, I suppose, her novel, in fact, it's, you know, it's about her, her semi-autobiographical novel. Um, yeah, I don't know, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good, very, really good questions, important questions. I mean, there's, yeah, in terms of, yeah, in terms of, um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I'll have to have uh, very, mm, very good question. I don't know, Martin, do you have any responses about that? I mean, she was, she was, yeah. Do you want to come in? Yeah, I think Louise, I think Louise would have considered herself to be a feminist. Um, during the time that I knew her, nothing really outstanding in terms of fe feminism to speak of. But when you look back on the period of time where, as a journalist, she was being able to, I think, hold her own in what was really a man's world. Uh, and again, one of those startling parallels uh, that Christian actually brings up in uh, Louise's uh, uh, journalism where she actually has a, a television program in New York City, where you're not allowed to use words like birth control and abortion. And this is what, 
60 years ago. And now we look at what's going on 2023. These same words are, are taboo again. Do either of you want to say something about the second question? Can you say much about her relationship with other women, particularly black women? Any comment, Martin, or? Unfortunately, I can't really think of uh, any uh, outstanding relationships uh, with black women in particular. Um, she, she had- Sybil uh, Lewis. I, I, I never knew uh, Sybil, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, you carry on, Martin. Sorry, I cut you off. Yeah. Un unfortunately, I can't think of any um, particular relationships with Black women that, that come to mind. But um, I, I really didn't see my grandmother all that much at the end of her life. Uh, most, of, most of my life, I remember my grandmother enjoyed poor health. And uh, partly it was because she had angina uh, for, for quite a few of those years. And when I think of that first memory of Louise telling me one day she's going to die when I was only about five years old. Um, no, I, I, unfortunately, I can't think of any outstanding relationships with black women. Uh, Christian, do you want to add anything? No. Um, not, not right now. She obviously, she, she not, not right now. I think it's other, okay. other people. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that question. Could, could, could I just chip in because oh, yes, Christian yes. just mentioned me, and it yeah, seems I really it, yeah, sorry, please, And please. it's a good opportunity for me to congratulate Christian because I do think he's done, and you know, and the collaboration between him and Martin has produced a really important book and retrieved a woman who has been vanished you know she has been erased by um history so it's very good to put her back into history and on the question of feminism of course she her life as you said she had she was advantaged by the first wave of organized feminism but then she was active in a period where feminism seemed to be a dead letter the it, you know many people regarded the main struggle as having been won the, the struggle for political rights and a whole slew of other issues social issues concerning women the politics of gender got submerged for really half a century nearly half a century until the emergence of second wave feminism in the 60s and i think during those decades louise was a very important figure as Christian's shown in his writing, keeping alive those issues, which we've, we've heard about, looking at the conditions in which women raise children, whether or not women had access to fertility control. You know, she herself, as we heard, had two illegal abortions as a, as a matter of necessity. So she really was in that sharp end of sort of dealing with politics agenda, but not being in a kind of organized women's movement where they were being taken up as political issues. And by the time that second wave feminism sort of burst out in, in the counterculture in, the, in America and then in Britain, Europe and wider, more widely, by that stage of her life, she was in Puerto Rico, she was older and she, she had found her way into other sorts of issues of, of important critical intervention. Um, so I just wanted to add in those that really to, to sort of contextualize it a bit. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jill. Right, I'll take Talat Ahmed next, and then there's a couple more questions coming in in chat. But Talat. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, no, a great talk, Christian, and um, fascinating individual. I suppose um, my question is really about, given that she does come from such a privileged background. I'm just thinking about sort of how one talks about and how one theorizes an individual like this, who I think is, you know, I, I agree with Jill that like whatever label you may wish to attach to her, feminist or otherwise, what's very clear from your talk in your book is that she stood firmly on the side of both women's liberation and also firmly on the side of the oppressed. And so she clearly was a fighter and was someone who had chosen a side. 
but I suppose I'm thinking more in terms of individuals from that kind of background and particularly women. Um, I suppose like the, the question is like, what are the kinds of things that lead someone like her in a position that she comes from to break with all the trappings of privilege um, and having a nice, comfortable lifestyle and being part and parcel of the system and instead choosing that they're actually going to stand in opposition to it. Um, because I'm thinking particularly, um, it's, it's not to the same extent, but because I work on South Asia um, and I teach about Gandhi, I'm thinking about a woman such as Madeleine Slade, who again, you know, was an admiral's daughter, came from a very upper class background, um, totally part of the elite. Um, and I'm not suggesting for one minute necessarily that there's an equation between the politics of Gandhi or the politics of Louise Cripps here, but nevertheless, Slade herself took a decision to remove herself from the privilege that she came from and therefore to identify with a completely different set of forces. And clearly Louise has done a similar thing. And I suppose I'm thinking about what are the kinds of things or, you know, in your own research or your reading of Louise's life, what do you feel um, were, were the kind of impetuses that led her to that? And this is also a question for Martin too. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. Christian, do you want to go first and then Martin? Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, no, really, yeah, really important question. I mean, she's, yeah, I mean, it's kind of, she's not, wasn't enormously, I mean, she's privileged. I mean, she was kind of middle, middle class in London, I suppose quite privileged, but she was different, I suppose, from say some figures like perhaps Nancy Cunard or something who, who came from, you know, had, had a, a greater privilege on one level. But interestingly, uh, Anna Gerling, who's company in the chat has, um, she told, pointed out both both Nancy Cunard and um, Louise Cripps both worked for Vogue before becoming moving left and getting involved in anti-colonial circles. It's kind of interesting that writing for Vo um, that that shift is quite staggering. I did try and interest uh, try and contact London Vogue to see if they might be interested in Louise Cripps's life, but uh, so far <laughs> I still okay. watch watch for space on that one. I think I think what's so critical about the thing is it's a polit it's a period they're living in. I think isn't it for both probably Nancy Cunard um and 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 louise Cripps samilov in a sense you know that you know well, louise was kind of not so political during the, during the 1920s um period there's still you know um enough poverty injustices still going on in, in britain you know you've got you know think of the general strike in the aftermath of that uh march of the un unemployed and so on and then into the great depression i think coupled with the question of fascism um becoming really uh, you know it's such a world historic moment she's living in the 1930s um you know it's not surprising there's a whole load of a lot of people I'm, I'm not sure about Madeleine Slate but that sort of period the um the really huge social questions thrown up at the just a, a time of crisis major crisis but, but I think it you know that it's that level of politics I think that, that would mean anyone with a kind of sense of injustice like that would would probably hopefully get get it moved to the left and get involved on one level um i'm not sure yeah i'll ask that um i'll just do let's just provide have to martin um and just i'll just answer some of this uh other questions in the chat which i'll just see him and i'll, I'll see him in in terms of her early writing yeah it's vogue and this question about a listener it's it's i need to go to the listener archive it's closed um at some point it, it's opening again and then try and see if there's a record of what she reviewed because it's just anonymous in the listener you can't actually see what she would have reviewed vogue is interesting though in this period vogue the time she's working on it um it, it does have a, a it does start to because of the depression and stuff it does start to have pages for um more everyday living and, and advice on looking good on a budget basically for the first time comes in in Vogue's period in that in that 1930s Great Depression period when she's working on it so it'd be interesting to know whether whether it's kind of anonymous again articles I couldn't see anything in Vogue you know uh with a but penned directly by her because it was anonymous I think perhaps you might think perhaps she contributed in some ways to that shift of saying let's have some <laughs> stuff in here about fashion for ordinary women on a budget at this time uh, of a cost of living crisis. I'll pass over to Martin. Um, yeah, thanks. 
so once again, it, during the time that uh, I knew my grandmother, she really, uh, I would say, didn't uh, have a perspective from uh, what we would consider white privilege. She actually lived very simply and at the end of her life possessed very little. Uh, and unfortunately, part of that was living in Puerto Rico, uh, the air was very corrosive. It was terrible for furniture, uh, uh, for anything hanging on the walls. Um, uh, also, when I think back to when Louise grew up in England, which was a time before I knew her, her father was a bookie. So, so really, um, I think the, the Cripps family, L Louise's family, came from probably a fairly modest uh, uh, English society where she was probably the black sheep in her family. And uh, a, a lot of the uh, uh, ideas that Louise had formed in her youth, I think, alienated her from her own family. So her trajectory, I would say, would very, very much be in keeping with uh, feminism, uh, as Jill described, the second wave of feminism, uh, I think is is where Louise would have would have uh, seen herself. Okay, um, right. There's a question in chat from Riyad Akba. What would you say are the main contributions she gave to our understanding of C.L.R. James? Christian. Um, I think it it does allow us i mean something i mean uh scholars like uh J john williams who's published a recent biography of um clr uh james if people look at that for example you he's focused very much on clr james's personality i think it'd be impossible really to write a book like that had it not been for the many women who recorded uh their their own experiences um and and relationships with with clr james over many decades um uh, and so on so in that sense it gives us a sense of more human personality of, of clr james but i think it also shines a light on the early trotskyist movement on one level because you know the, in britain um because it's the, the historiography of that in the 1930s still is fairly neglectful of the women involved with it they're, they're still um, a need for more, I think, richer histories of of British Trotskyism um, in all in all periods, but particularly, you know, this nineteen thirties period, the, the kind of organisational histories of British Trotskyism which exist for this period tend to be very much about the, the meetings and the resolutions and and what happened. And I think Louise Cripps's life gives us a real a different sense of what it was actually like to be a Trots, you know, Trotskyist activist or, you know, in a small group in 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 the nineteen thirties at this time and the kind of everyday activity and, and culture, if you like, of, of what that Trotskyist movement does. Um, so I think in that sense, that that's, that enriches our understanding of C.L.R. James, if you like, as well, of, of a kind of circle he was moving in, the kind of activist circles that he, he was, yeah, he, he, he was he was around, particularly in the 30s and, and into the 40s period, because she did reunite briefly with C.L.R. James in, in the 1940s. They were both in, in New York uh, for a period in the early 40s as well. So she has some yeah, in, in insightful things about that. There's a question about cricket as well, and um, I'd have to pass over to Martin about uh, about whether how interested Louise was in cricket. Okay, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm aware Francis has got a question for it. Yeah. yeah, Martin, do you want to come in on cricket? Well, Martin please? first, and then there's, there's others what's coming. I don't think I ever heard Louise mention once the word cricket when it came to CLR James. I don't think cricket reckoned at all in uh, Louise's uh, relationship with CLR James. Although, again, to me, a lot of Louise's relationship to CLR James was a mystery. And my only gleaning was uh, from her one book, uh, work of fiction, uh, Lyrizel, which uh, she had attempted to previously publish. Uh, and my attempt at reading it, um, I struggled. I found it very difficult to read largely because who wants to think about their grandmother having a fantasy about a relationship she had from the past? It's, for me, it was kind of icky just having to think about my grandmother's relationship. I mean, I've since come to reconcile that. You know, I think one of the things that I really appreciate about Louise is that she was in every way uh, a very human person, uh, prone to the frailties and failures that we as humans experience. So uh, uh, despite whatever setbacks, she 
always seem to just bounce back and live a long life. Okay, thanks. Uh, Francis. Oh, I have very, very interesting. Um, looking at the book, uh, can you hear me? Is, is the microphone working? Yeah, good. Yeah, I mean, look, looking at the book, you you uh, have reference to uh, Louise still considering herself to be a Trotskyist right up into her 90s. But for reasons, um, well, I, I can think of plenty of reasons, she, she didn't seem to have uh, got involved in that movement uh, after leaving after leaving Britain, did she have any kind of dealings with any of the American Trotskyist organisations, or did she um, uh, possibly rather wisely keep her distance from all of them? Is there any information on this? Francis, you're muted. Thanks. Yeah. Um, no, she she killed, called herself a kind of Trotskyist. Um, uh, yeah, until, and, until we. You know, until the end of her life, really, that was her framework—a kind of that, in in one sense, you know, not a kind of orthodox Trotskyist, but a kind of Trotskyist. I mean, there's a quote she has, which I we have on the back cover, you know, saying, um, "It was the, the experience of the 1930s would colour my political perspective for a lifetime." When I started writing my own books at last, they were written from the perspective of those views I'd learned in James's London group of Trotskyists. Uh, they're written mostly from political viewpoint, not a literary one. I mean, in a sense, she still has a yeah, kind of a Marxisty analysis in her books. Um, she she was interested in she she describes in her. It's difficult to know really exactly um, what what contact she might have had with American Trotsky. She met tended to meet up with co uh, friends and comrades of the British Trotskyist movement when they if they'd gone to the US and stuff and old friends and meet up with them and be on Canada actually. You know, Earl, Earl Burney, um, for example, the Canadian poet um, who knew James in the thirties and was active in most circles, um, and so yeah, I mean she 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 did in in her memoirs and commentaries book she does she does get quite interested in uh, um, a publication by I think it's a Dutch Orthodox Trotskyist group called Spartacus or something that comes her way with a kind of Orthodox Trotskyist critique of C L R James so she seemed to quite like that. A bit and, and agree with that in terms of CLR James's later evolution away, but I don't think there's much evidence that she particularly got involved politically. Yeah, again in that sense with with the organised far left, in, which in America was, is you know kind of uh, um, increasingly weak come the sort of fifties and sixties really. Um, uh, yeah, but it's 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 interest. Yeah, it's an interesting question, um, and she still had contacts with. Um, people, a friend who was still a Trotskyist, another forgotten woman, um, it seems like Barbara Fisher, who was active in the Labour Party in Britain, who stayed in Britain, being a comrade. So she still had some odd correspondence and stuff with people who were, in some sense, still identified with Trotskyism, I think. But um, I don't know if Mar Martin wants to come in on that. Um, just on cricket, I remembered actually that she grew up around living near Lords, and she describes being taken by family traditional kind of middle class thing go and watch cricket uh there with strawberry and stuff strawberries and stuff so she would have grown up having a some kind of appreciation of cricket as a young young girl perhaps but um how interested she was in the, in the cricket <laughs> being taken there when she was young i don't know um martin yeah martin so um as christian has described the three different phases in louisa's life first growing up in england then moving to the united states and then finally to puerto rico the United States, uh, in my life, for Louise, was really uh, her homemaking period. So there was, I would say, a bit of a lapse during that time in the United States, where uh, her involvement politically was more, uh, I would say, mainstream as a participant in supporting uh, the Democratic Party in the United States. She uh, volunteered, it was would have been in the 1968 election uh, uh, for George McGovern. And again, uh, she was already at an age where her health was kind of delicate. I remember she came back after, I think she had been out uh, going door to door uh, campaigning and had a bit of an angina attack. It was a bit of a dramatic moment again, because I was so young seeing my grandmother kind of in a bit of a medical crisis. Uh, so that that phase uh, where uh, Louise lived in the United States was probably um, the, the the least politically uh, involved period of her life. And then uh, once uh, settled in Puerto Rico, again, 
with the uh, various political uh, events that were going on in the island. Uh, Louise, again, I think was able to uh, reunite uh, her ideology with what was going on at the time in Puerto Rico. I mean, even to this day, uh, there is certainly a, a struggle, I would say, uh, uh, in Puerto Rico. The last time I was there was in 2000. At that time, one of the island territories had been used for bombing practice by uh, the U.S. military, and there was an accidental death. Uh, a, a local Puerto Rican was accidentally killed on Culebra Island, which is a territory of Puerto Rico. And uh, from that time on, there was a, a, a strengthening of anti-American sentiment among Puerto Ricans. So uh, unfortunately, uh, in the time since, I would say there's uh, still a bit of a divide. Uh, the the uh, current governor uh, represents uh, what is considered a progressive uh, political entity in Puerto Rico, but it's really, I would say, down the middle um, there would be a, a fair divide among Puerto Ricans now uh, moving for statehood with the United States, probably as much as uh, maintaining uh, uh, an independent Puerto Rican uh, free associated state with the U.S. Okay, thanks. Um, Anna Gerling, you put a comment in chat. Do you want to say anything? Or has, has that been answered? Um, sorry, no, Christian answered it. So thank you very much. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's fine. Um, right, does anybody uh, who's not said anything yet want to make any points? And then I'll bring John Walker, who's got his hand up, but he's spoken already. Anybody else? Last chance. Okay, John. Oh no, sorry, can I take Gad Human first? Okay. Um, Christian, hi, Christian. Thanks very much for that. And uh, uh, hi, Martin. So my question probably is uh, difficult to answer. I mean, I think people must recognize or do recognize that the, that the independence movement in Puerto Rico has traditionally been extra, very interesting, but very small, tiny. Um, and here is this woman that you've described very well, uh, Anglo-American woman. Uh, living in Puerto Rico, Anglo-American white woman living in Puerto Rico. So it might be interesting to reflect on how in the world she was regarded uh, in that in that environment. Okay, Christian, Martin, any comments? Yeah, I, I think she, I mean, I think she did recognize, her, 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 you know, relative privilege, uh, as you use that, use that term there. But I think she also did have a, you know, she what she did have a kind of a small audience and a, and a degree of respect. I mean, her, she was a local publisher that published her books, you know, her, some of her pamphlets and stuff like that, Puerto Rican publisher. She got an award um, from the Society of Puerto Rican Authors, where she said she was the only, where she claimed she was, the, yeah, the only uh, sort of white, yeah, white person to ever really get, get this kind of award or American, did she um, <laughs> try and find the quote? Um, so she she did. I think she did, you know, and but her, but her books were not, you know, they were small, you know, small press, small, small uh, publication run, a bit like this, the Louise Cripps <laughs> Samalov book here. But it's um, it, it's it's that she did, you know, she did. She was always thrilled when it did get into libraries. She did have a kind of a left wing American publisher for some of her books uh, as well. Um, and so she, she hoped that it would reach the Puerto Rican community in the US as well, her, her writings. So I think that in that sense, um, you know, and I think the strident titles of her books as well, you know, the case, you know, very clear, you know, the case for independence stuff would have attracted, um, you know, a degree of, yeah, a degree of uh, respect, even though you're right, that the movement itself was was very small. And, you know, she was, again, a bit probably divorced from the, from, from, uh, the actual activism of that movement as well on one level. Um, Ma Martin might have a thoughts, but good question. Thank you, Ged. I would say it's absolutely true that uh, Louise's uh, efforts and work appeal to a very small audience. Um, but uh, Perry Thomas, one of uh, the activists that uh, you mentioned, Christian, John K. Lewis, uh, there was a definite circle, and I think throughout Louise's life, she was able to uh, affect her activism with like-minded people. And I find that's one of the more fascinating aspects mm -hmm. of seeing some of the some of the people that she encountered in her life, 
when I look back on when my grandma would be essentially name dropping, you know, I sort of, oh, there's grandma. She's going on about her Marxist days. But those days never really left in, in her own way, even in uh, her memoir, CLR James. She does concede that um, we were dreamers, essentially. But in dreaming, uh, I think people were able to make an effect in the in the circle of people that they could influence. And I think that's maybe Louise's strength. Okay, uh, right, John Walker, last point from you. Uh, it's, it's not a point, it's a question. Well, no, there, is, there is a minor, minor point in that uh, McGovern was the 72 election, not the, the 68 one, but that actually does partly answer my question about the Vietnam War and her attitude to it. Um, but what I wanted was a, a discussion about um, uh, Christian talking about the way in which she related to uh, people she'd known, political friends she'd known in Britain when they were in the States, for example, made me think about, well, what about when CLR James was in the States? Um, did, did, was she at all in contact with him? Was, was, was there any interaction there or, uh, or, or not? Okay, Christian, then Martin. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, but um, that's right. There, there was because they both in yeah, nineteen forty. She she does get she does have his address. They um, she goes to see him and they think about yeah rekindling their relationship. But again, now she's got uh, yeah she's got her son with her now, and and so CLR James is like, look, don't worry, you know the American Trotskyist movement will look after him. Don't worry, we can be together. And I think she has. Uh, enough of a sense that that's then you know she needs to <laughs> she can't just <laughs> rely on the American Trotskyist movement uh, to to look after her, her child and and yeah, and so on. So I think she she then again makes a split again with with CLR James um, uh, there. But they they you know they remain close. And it's interesting as what 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 Martin said about CLR offering to be the godfather to to her son is really, I think, telling of, of, of that relationship. And they, they do retain uh, a kind of um, a sort of uh, on-off kind of correspondence over the years as well. Um, uh, and yeah, and and so on. Um, and occasionally meet at things. That, that's described in the, in her CLR James memoirs and commentaries the time she does meet up with, with CLR James again in later in later years, odd times as well, uh, at events or, or and things like that. Um, but yeah, no, um, I, I, yeah, I haven't got much more to say. I just want to say thanks again to everyone for coming and thanks everyone for your for your questions and um and thank yeah and also I'll pass over to Martin. Also, I think Martin's gonna we got salt. Uh, Martin's a musician. He's a um really yeah really great musician. So he's gonna we're gonna end with a kind of video where people can leave with, with one of Martin's songs playing. But I'll pass over to Martin for last words as well. But thank okay, you. Okay, everyone. Martin. Um, do you want to say a few words and then I do need to make an announcement before we play the music. Well, thank you, John. Sorry, I was only about nine years old at the time in 1968. I might have gotten uh, my names mixed up there. Uh, so uh, uh, a point about CLR James that uh, comes up in John Williams' description, as well as in Christian's book, on page 50, uh, people who didn't fit into CLR James's uh, plans are regrettably discarded. And uh, I, I think that is kind of a, a hallmark of uh, relationships that came and went out of CLR James's life, including uh, regrettably Louise's. And I guess uh, in her attempt to keep in touch with CLR James, she actually passed along uh, a copy of uh, Lyrazel to uh, CLR James. And I guess he had the same difficulty, maybe different difficulties, that I had in in trying to uh, to read the book. I, I also wanted to mention, actually, there was a, a, a scene Christian describes when Louise had the opportunity in her uh, adventure in Paris to meet uh, the liaison with Trotsky, a fellow who was named Adolf. Now, this was probably a, a very intriguing time. And again, in my mind, I sort of see it as part of a screenplay. This would be a scene in a movie. So Louise actually passed up the opportunity to to be an assistant and found out uh, shortly afterward, Adolf uh, drowned. So 
again, a very exciting time. Uh, and these are adventures I had no idea about until I'm, I'm reading them recently. Okay, thanks very much to, to, to both Christian and Martin. Just a quick announcement. Um, for those of you who aren't members of the Social Statistics Society, do join, go on our website. Uh, for joining, you get the uh, Socialist History Journal, our peer review journal, twice a year, a couple of occasional publications, and this one we've been discussing is the most recent, uh, and also our newsletter. Our, our next uh, meeting online is 24th of April at 7 p.m., which is Helen Mercer speaking about James Aldridge, the post war novelist. So, I hope you can join us uh, then. Uh, so details and login arrangements are on the Social Assistance Society website. So over to the music. This should appear on the screen in a moment. <laughs> There's a song I wrote about 30 years ago that was first performed for May Day, May 1st. This was uh, 1992. Uh, the song's called What Is Enough? And essentially, uh, it's a song about sustainability. Uh, a bit of a rhetorical question, really. What is enough? I guess it's a relative term. And I just wanted to share, if, if I could show you a picture. It's one of my favorite pictures of Louise. Let's see if it... I can make yeah. it. Thank you. Oh my gosh, she looks almost like the queen. <laughs> <With the pearls. laughs> right, my apologies. I've not been able to play the music. Uh, what I will do, though, as it's on YouTube, I have a list of everyone who's been at this uh, uh, event. Uh, when you registered. So I'll make sure I send you the link so you can all listen Excellent. to it in your own time. Uh, so uh, uh, technological failure. But, maybe uh, put, the link in the, yeah. put the link in the chat as well, couldn't we, I suppose? Yeah. Uh, and then people could go and listen to Get a that. link in the chat. I'll do my best. Uh, it's... Well, thanks so much. And uh, if you look yeah. up my name, Martin Samoyloff, on YouTube, uh, there are seven different music videos. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Martin. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. Link. So anyway, I'll send it, I'll send it to everyone. Uh, and yeah. uh, uh, and it also yeah. that way gets the people who registered but didn't turn up. <laughs> Good. Yeah. <Okay>. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thank you, Martin. Thanks Thank for you, joining Martin. us. And thanks, yeah. thanks everyone. Thanks Thank to you. Thank you for the IT. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Bye bye all. Bye. Nice to meet you, Christian. Thanks, everyone. Nice okay. to meet you, Martin. Nice okay. to meet you Thank as you well. Martin. I hope we'll keep in touch. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Good. All the best. Right, we're just down to the last two or three. Yeah, you better switch the recording yeah. off. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Duncan. Just in case anybody wants to chat.